Good Tuesday afternoon to you. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for joining Sports for CLE. I'm Dave Bacon. Uh, we will talk plenty of Browns. Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report will be joining us. A little later in the show, we will head out to Lake County and talk Lake County captains with the owner and the general manager, as well as the manager of the Indians' high-A affiliate, the Lake County captains over at Classic Park. But we get, begin... Uh, it's draft week, so we're going to talk Browns. Let's welcome in Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. Uh, you can catch draft day coverage, 730 OBR YouTube channel, 730 both Thursday and Friday. Jake and the o Orange and Brown uh, Report crew will break it down and give you a local angle on this draft. Jake, let's begin this one. Uh, Browns draft needs. What do you see as, as areas the Browns should look to, to fill in the draft coming up? Well, they, they definitely are going to um, be interested in bringing in talent on the defensive side of the football. You could talk about cornerbacks. You could talk about edge guys. There's definitely a need to improve coverage. They they have uh, a, a bevy of talent in certain positions. Uh, in, in, in the top of those positions, Miles Garrett, uh, you know Denzel Ward. I think if you look at positions that they want to expand upon, you definitely look at corner. You definitely look at another young edge rusher. And then you you would probably look on the offensive side of the ball, wide receiver. You could make a claim for linebacker, but until guys, until I see them value the linebacker position for a top end pick, I just don't see them necessarily doing it. So uh, if they prove me wrong, then we'll have some evidence that they do value that position. But for now, we we don't necessarily see that. So think about as many positions on the back half of your defense as possible. They could add another safety. I think that's a relevant thing. But corner, edge, wide receiver are probably the ones that you'll see them most linked to first round guys for. I thought it was kind of interesting. Andrew Berry, when he talked about the draft, mentioned, you know, you don't necessarily go for instant gratification um, in the draft. You go for guys that you can develop and, and fill your roster with long term. A little bit of a smoke screen. Are you still looking for guys that can come in and play or, or are you buying that a lot of this is kind of developmental type guys? Uh, I think they'll try to find the best of both worlds. I mean, you don't want to look at something and say, okay, we need to plug this position right away with the player that we think can come in right now and start and be a great player. If that's the case, that's that's great. But you don't want to reach for a position because you feel like maybe you need to go get a player uh, at a certain spot because – uh, we need a corner here and we need to go up and get a player who maybe you're reaching for that position. So they want to do the best that they can do to find the long game here. I think people misunderstand how, how their roster set up to not really have uh, many, many, they're not really committed to many people outside of the next year. I think there's only five players committed to 2023 under contract. So they're playing the long game here. And, and, and if they think a defensive end fits or they think an, a, a defensive tackle is the best player, they know that they need future building blocks not that they don't have guys on the roster that they're going to keep around like they are. They're just keeping their opportunities and options open. And uh, if a player presents itself at the right time, at the right place, they're not going to hold off on a guy because, oh, we have, you know, we have Odell Beckham and we have Jarvis Landry. No, they, they, they might look at changing that up at the end of next year. So I think that's what Andrew Barry's trying to say is I know most of draft night, everybody looks at like, okay, how does this impact 2021? Well, the Browns are trying to say not only how does it impact our upcoming year, but how does it impact the next three years after that or the fifth-year option for a first-round player? That's the long game he's probably most referencing. And it's planting a little seed that they won't be deterred from certain positions just because uh, they currently have a nice setup there. And there's no greater example of, of that than interior offensive line. I think they will check out a guy in the middle rounds there uh, to potentially supplant if they can't sign Wyatt Teller long-term. Or if, uh, you know, Joel Batonio and J.C. Treader aren't getting any younger. So they'll keep an eye on the future as well as, uh, you know, guys who could come in and make immediate impact on, on, on either side of the ball. Do you get a sense um, they're likely to trade up, trade down? Is, is one more likely than the other? Or is either likely? Uh, cor trading down with this front office will always be the most likely outcome. I think they have planted some seeds that they're in, in, in a go-for-it type of situation. So... If, if J.C. Horn reaches pick 18 or 19, I'm sure that they're going to have an internal discussion on trading up for that player at a great position of need for a player that probably shouldn't fall that far. They will have those discussions. But at the end of the day, I think the highest percentage is that they trade. They sit at pick 26 and pick a player. The next number down would be that they trade back. And, um, you know, the lowest percentage in terms of what we would expect them to do would be to trade up. So uh, it, it's not ever off the board. I just don't think that there's a situation where they do that unless 
like I said, somebody like J.C. Horn or Patrick Sertan falls at a position that they really covet, uh, that type of thing, because there's not really an edge guy that is, air quotes, elite in this class enough that if he falls, and, and listen, there aren't enough elite ones for any of them to fall very far, uh, so they could they could definitely do that. Now, if somebody like Jalen Waddle, the wide receiver from, from Alabama, slips and falls a little bit, maybe they can move up to get him, but I just don't see it. It seems highly unlikely, and to be honest, what I've grown accustomed to thinking about here is that a lot of the players of picks 25 to 45 are pretty similar, and I think we're going to talk about this a little later, and that's why I don't have a real big problem with trading back and collecting some capital this year, another second or third, or even getting another second or third next year. So uh, a lot of interesting options on the table when they get up. Does the fact that they have nine picks this year, does that, you think, preclude them potentially? A and a roster that that's pretty good by all accounts. It's It's a pretty solid roster that they have, and they have nine picks. Yeah, I think people kind of get carried away with the nine number. I mean, any pick in the 200s, Dave, is like a just it's a it's a it's a lottery ticket essentially. That player's probably not going to make your roster unless your roster's pretty weak, unless you hit on a guy and you that happens every now and again, but it's not that normal. So you really have seven premium picks. And if I look at the Browns roster, I certainly see I could find nine players who I think are uncertain to make it. Are they OK players? Are those nine players as bad as the 2018 or sorry, 2017 bottom nine? Absolutely not. But they are nine guys that I could see like, OK, they could improve upon this player if they find a better option out there. So I view it more as seven premium picks uh, with a couple late lotto tickets and even pick 169 is, you know, you're the 169th most coveted player in a single draft you know what i mean so like it gets a little challenging there but that's still a pretty good pick that you could find a player at and i think that they want to get somebody there so i view it as seven picks and then a couple a uh, lot of scratch off tickets that maybe they could find something there <laughs> all right here's a here's a couple that are interesting from the bleacher report trades that would make sense um during draft day so they have the browns uh getting stefan gilmore and the Patriots getting the 59th and 90th pick. So a second and third uh, from the Browns this year to get Stephon Gilmore. What do you think of that? It's tough to me. Like that, that, that the reason that's tough, Dave, is not that you're not getting a good player. It just would kind of go against what their MO is as a front office and how they look at what you're not paying for past performance. You're paying for what the future is going to be. Is Stephon Gilmore at age 30 in a contract year going to give you what you think Stephon Gilmore has been before? I don't know. I really don't know. And it's a pretty deep cornerback class and can have some really nice players in that second and third round, the picks you're talking about there, if they were to move uh, 59 or either one of the picks, 89 or 91. So I, I probably wouldn't do that. But if you could get Stephon Gilmore, now hear me out here, if you could get Stephon Gilmore as a part of a package where maybe New England – goes from pick 43 or they're, I think they're pick 43 or 42 in the second round. They come up to pick 26. The Browns get that 42, maybe next year's one or next year's two, uh, probably like a next year's two and a fourth this year and Gilmore in that mix. Uh, that gets a little bit more interesting. So maybe New England tags uh, and they get, they can get Mac Jones or Trey Lance or Justin Fields falls to 15 and they want uh, Rashad Bateman, the wide receiver. They want to come up and get him. You know, it's only five minutes between picks, so you're just looking for one team to get a little desperate, and that could happen. So I think Gilmore is an active discussion from Cleveland's side. They are interested in him, but they're not going to let themselves get fleeced for a player who's 30 and going into the last year of his contract is going to probably want another couple, two or three years on a deal. Well, the other one um, that uh, Bleacher Report had from this same one, and it's tr trades that make sense for each of the teams. So they have the Browns um, getting a third-round pick this year, 73rd overall, third-round pick next year, and trading the Panthers' David and Joku. Reaction to that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so it's a third this year, a third next year. I guess it depends. I mean, like, there are some tight ends that I really like that are young tight ends, like like Hunter Long uh, from, from Boston College. Brevin Jordan from Miami is another interesting guy in the third round. So could you use – Pick 73 to go get somebody like that. Somebody like Tommy Trimble from Notre Dame was a young prospect. If they like some of those guys enough, sure. I mean, the thing with David is I think David could have a very nice season. I, I definitely do. But he's on the last year of his contract. And it, and, and maybe, maybe David is to the point that he doesn't love the idea of coming back to Cleveland and playing in this offense and splitting time 
with a bunch of other tight ends in a position that doesn't get a ton of deep downfield targets. So there's some of that, that that's internal discussions. That's talking with David's agent. That's a bunch of different things. But if they were to move him for a third this year and a third next year, I think that that would be a, a fine move if they have a nice plan uh, to replace him. I'm high on Harrison Bryant. I think people cooled on him by the end of the year. I think he's still a, a nice young player at the position. I think Austin Hooper set the bounce back in a nice way. They like Steven Carlson enough to have kept him around for now, what, a third or fourth year. So uh, there are opportunities if, if, if they think, you know, if they think David is worth just a third this year, let alone getting another third the next year, I, I could certainly see where they're coming from. And Carolina would benefit from having him. I mean, he's a nice athletic tight end who's, I think David's still only 24 years old coming into his own to play this, this year. I think he'll play at 25. So he's still very young and he's, he's getting better. He's got to, He's got to keep fighting for consistency, but he's getting better. So that would that's an interesting trade. Jake Burns and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. I want to remind you, you can follow Jake and the entire Orange and Brown Report crew. The OBR YouTube channel will be streaming live draft coverage with a Cleveland slant to it, both uh, Thursday at 7.30 and Friday at 7.30. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. On the other side of the break, we're going to take a look at some mock drafts. We'll hear who Chris Sims thinks the Browns should take and how he fits. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Life is starting to get back on track, and you can too. If you or your family have experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, Tri-C can help with full tuition assistance. Safely get the in-demand degree or training you need with online and on-campus classes. Go to tric-edu to check out our programs and resources. So what are you waiting for? Register now for summer classes. Tri-C is where futures begin. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just a mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. For CLE continues, I'm Dave Bacon. NFL Draft just a couple of days away. Mock drafts going into their final ones. Take a listen to uh, Chris Sims from NBC Sports, who he thinks the Browns will take at 26. You know, I look at the Browns, and I, I had a tough time with them here. I did. Hmm. I ultimately go with Zayvon Collins from Tulsa. Okay. And this might be out of the mold of what they really want. But... You know, middle linebacker, you've heard me talk about it. It's so important to this scheme. You know, whether it's Miles Jack or, you know, uh, Bobby Wagner or Fred Warner or Darius Leonard, you know, it's, it's, it's Deion Jones and Atlanta. It's all yeah. the same defensive sc scheme. They got to have that athletic guy that, yeah, can run sideline to sideline, but also gets asked for a middle linebacker to do some pretty interesting things in their zone coverages to where you got to be athletic. So there is a Sims talking about who he would take with the Browns. Let's bring back in Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. Um, what do you make of it, uh, Jake? I, I feel like a broken record. I, I just keep saying it. I'll believe it when I see it. I think I think Zavin's a fine player. He's 270. He can run. He's For his size, he can move well. He's got good coverage metric data from his college days. He can get after the 
uh, the quarterback a little bit when they send him inside. The same with Jamin Davis, who's a, who's a freak athlete who tested through the roof and he's got the size. Uh, there's a kid that not many people talk about from Missouri named Nick Bolton who didn't test great. But if you watch the tape, like that guy's a vicious interior linebacker. And then another guy that that I don't think he's a linebacker. I kind of I think he's truly a hybrid player uh, that I I would just call a rover. I wouldn't even peg him as a safety or a linebacker. It's Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa from Notre Dame. He gets the linebacker peg. He might not even. I don't think he'll even be there at 26. But um, the, the, that grouping of guys, I, I keep JOK on its own. I would take him in a heartbeat. But the other three, and even into the guys like Jabril Cox from LSU, is just a fuzz older than the type of player they look for, but is a fun athlete and has got some great coverage stuff on tape from his LSU year. There, there are exciting linebackers. Pete Werner from Ohio State is an interesting player. If you can get Baron Browning, another Ohio State guy, to get into the right spots for you, he's an interesting target. I just don't know. Like I just like the Zaven J- Jamin Davis types that are early type of guys on 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 a people's radar. I'll believe it when I see it. I can I can I'm not a big like I told you so type of guy with the draft. I want to understand your reasoning for it. So if you take Zaven or you take Jamin or you take uh, uh, even like if it's a Wusu Koromoa, tell me why. Why did you need that? Why did your defense need that? Why did you? What's your thought process? That's a it's a big thing the Browns like to talk about when they send up scouts and different things. Uh, they give us some good insight into their thought process. And I think from a media's perspective that is league wide, they look at the Browns roster and they see names. They see Denzel Ward. They see John Johnson. They see even Greedy Williams name and know the investment they put in him. And they see Genevieve and Clowney. They know Miles. And they think, who do we not really know much? Well, who are the Browns linebackers? Can they improve there? while kind of ignoring all of the information the Browns put out and their recent track record uh, of not taking that position. So um, I'm not going to be a person who says, man, I cannot believe they made that gigantic cataclysmic mistake by selecting a linebacker 26 or whatever. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity for that player to be really good. But I, again, will be pretty surprised if they go against the grain and make that selection. Well, it's kind of interesting because we know that um, one of the players the Browns have talked to is Zayvon Collins. So, so take a listen to Collins explain um, the type of system he thinks he fits into. Yeah, so I've taught a lot of teams that ask me what position I want to play, and I don't know their defense. Like, I don't know, um, you know, the Steelers defense. I don't know the Cleveland defense. I don't know the Dallas Cowboys defense. I know no defenses right now. Um, but – I think the thing that best uh, suits me is uh, my abilities to best accommodate to whatever position. So um, I would say uh, the position that's able to let someone run, chase down, make tackles in the backfield, um, you know, be in coverage, um, just run sideline to sideline, whatever position that is for a team, that's the position I'd like to be in. So, Jake, is he a scheme fit or is he a scheme mismatch for for what the Browns want to do there? He's telling you he can do it all, which, you know, (laughs) these guys have come from it. He's always been able to do it all his whole life, you know, like these guys, especially Zabin, who could have been an impactful player in the SEC or Big Ten, is playing at Tulsa in the conference he finds himself in, which I believe they're they're in Conference USA or the the big AAC or something like that. I can't think off the top of my head, but, like, he's obviously the best player on the field, like – I think he can fill a bunch of different roles. I think he can be a guy who plays curl flat hook zone as an outside backer who runs, like he said, a lot of long distances to get where he needs to track down players. I also think if you're going to use an aggressive linebacker who you walk up off the edge and let him play run support and, and let him rush off the edge or or you use him as a heavy interior blitz guy, he can do that too. So I'm not here to say Zaven's wrong at all. I think he's he's making a great point about, listen, man, I don't really know what these guys are doing defensively because I, I would imagine he didn't have a ton of time to sit down and do that kind of conversa- conversating like he would in normal years. But he's not wrong. He's graded well in coverage. I think he's a fine run fit defender. He can, he can play at 265. He'll probably play at 265 or so, 260. That's well big enough to be able to handle guys at the, from the first level uh, without letting linemen absorb too much, you know, get your, get into your chest and drive you. I think he's got enough shiftiness to be where he needs to be. What it comes down to is do the Browns think linebackers impact winning? Do they think that quality investment and quality linebacker play from that investment translates to more wins on Sunday? If not, they need to invest in their their the, the two things that stop quarterbacks the most, covering them 
uh, covering wide receivers with a, with a corner or a safety that can do a little bit of both, uh, or guys that can rush the passer because that's the biggest thing in the NFL. It's not it's not running the football so much anymore, man. It's how do we stop the throw, and that's do we invest in coverage or do we invest in um, guys who can get after the quarterback and get him on the ground. So uh, we will have our answer by you know probably Friday night about how much they value because there is a a bevy of guys in the round one, two, and three area that could be of interest for them when they come up at those those two picks and then into pick 89, 91, uh, where they took Jacob Phillips last year, there will be some interesting guys there too. So they, I'm, I will, I would not be surprised. Listen, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't take one at all. So that's where I'm at with it. If they went up and took one round one and you cut into a, a Skype or you guys called me and let's live look at Jake's face, it would probably be like bug eyed, stunned. <laughs> so I just, that's just kind of where I am with it, and, and I'll tweet out that I was wrong if I'm wrong, as I usually do. Well, and, and here's another one. So Ryan Wilson, CBS Sports Mock Draft, has the Browns taken Micah Parsons, fallen all the way to 26, which most players, he's in the, in the some as high as 10, some in the mid-teens. Um, if somebody like that fell, is that the, is that the same kind of thing? I mean, I think Mike is a more athletic version of Zavin. Uh, I think he's a little less proven in coverage uh, is, 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 is the thing. But people like his athlete. I mean, he ran a 4-3 something. I mean, he's an explosive jumper. He's, an, he's a good athlete. He's a great athlete. I'm going to take that back. He's an elite athlete. But the question is, there are some things that surround him from his time at Penn State, and I don't have any insight into it, and it's ultimately none of my business. But it is the business of NFL teams, and they they talk about it, and it's something that's popped up. Uh, but I I think from everything that you seem to hear, that if a team is all in on a second level player that can impact both phases, they think and has the athletic ability to change games. I've heard Denver being very interested in him at nine. If all the quarterbacks are off the board, I have heard uh, and connected him to the to the Raiders at seventeen. Now. From everything I gather, and listen, I don't know everybody that's come in and out of Cleveland. I don't know everybody they've talked about, but people at our site have a nice feel for this. Lane Atkins has been doing this stuff, talking to people inside the building for decades. He has not heard a single whisper of Micah Parsons being connected to Cleveland in any way, shape, or form. Has not heard them talk about him or connect a visit to him or anything. So if he's there, maybe their thought process is we're not even expecting him to be there, so we're not going to waste our time. That could be a, a big part of it, but... There just might not be a general interest for that player, so that's that's all I kind of know at this point. Um, and then the the last one that we'll take a look at in this segment, um, uh, the mock draft, they have the Browns taking Rashad Bateman. Now, is that one if you saw if you see him at twenty six, you could see the Browns absolutely going after? Yeah, I think if the first four corners are gone, if if you see Sertan and Horn go early, you see. Uh, Caleb Farley from Virginia Tech, who's every bit as good as any of these other guys go. And then you see maybe like the Titans or the Colts or the Bears who need a corner. Take Greg Newsom and the first four corners are off the board. And then maybe Quiddy Pay and Aziz Ojolari are off the board. Maybe the guys that they, I'm just putting names out uh, in ranges I have heard are off the board. If the board falls to the point that they're like, hey, we don't see a corner that we love at this point. We don't see a... Uh, we don't see an edge guy that we love at this point. We don't see an interior defensive lineman we love. We do have a round one grade on Rashad Bateman. We could take him here, and they look at offers for a trade-up, and nobody's giving them something worth taking, uh, and they took Rashad Bateman. I'd be happy with it. He's, an, he's a fun, fun player. Six foot 190, a good athlete, tested pretty well, but not elite, but that doesn't matter because I think his tape is elite. A little bit of a drop issue that has popped up, but not something that overly concerns me because he separates so well. He, he's got a ton of wiggle in his, his approach. He's got great route nuance, great feet at the break point, in and out of cuts effectively. A, a nice, I think he plucks the football when he does. And I think, too, some of it is guys who have drop issues can sometimes be guys who exclusively use their hands. You know, sometimes those body catchers can find a little more consistency, but they don't create those plays after catch because they're jump catching the ball into their body or they're letting it get into their shoulder pads. And that eliminates you from catching and running in fluid, uh, fluid motion. And, and Bateman has that stuff. I think he's got, he's got a lot of interesting tools uh, and his tape is phenomenal, especially his 2019 tape before his 2020 tape that he had COVID that really, he came down with it and he lost 20 pounds before he opted out. It really impacted his five games his last year there last year. So uh, if you look back at 2019 Rashad Bateman, you're like, I could see that guy being a top four receiver in this draft period. So 
uh, I would be pleased if they took him for sure. Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report and I going to take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we're going to talk a little bit about free agents that are remaining. The top free agents. We'll see uh, if Jake thinks there's a fit there for the Browns. Sports for CLE will be right back. Stay with us. Presque Downs and Casino has sports betting. Use one of our 50 state-of-the-art Bet America kiosks to place your bet and watch your favorite games on one of our many HD televisions or visit our sportsbook area. Only at Presque Isle Downs and Casino. Better days are ahead. Be ready with the training you'll need to get a great job. If you or your family has experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, try seeking help with full tuition assistance. Whether you want to improve your skills, get certified, or train for a new career, go to try-c.edu to check out our programs and resources. So what are you waiting for? Register now for online and on-campus summer classes. Try-C is where futures begin. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just a mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. Welcome back to Sports for CLE. I'm Dave Bacon. We continue talking Browns football with Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. So, Jake, Pro Football Focus has a list of the top remaining free agents. Um, and uh, these are guys that they say could be potential fits for the Browns. Um, they are also listed with some other teams. Number one on their list, Richard Sherman, cornerback. Uh, what do you think the likelihood of that one is? I should take my mic off mute. That's on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it depends on it depends on what Richard's mindset is. He is obviously an older player. Um, he 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 is not. He's been okay, San Francisco years. I, I just if he if he's trying to come in and be a starter and be guaranteed a certain number of snaps, you probably pass on that quickly. But if he wants to take a leadership role in this whole thing and and uh, help a cornerback room come along and provide. Uh, the ability to 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 have depth somewhere, uh, I think that that would be an interesting guy because he has a lot of bravado and and he could give you some flexibility and heavy uh, defensive back usage scenario. So um, yeah, like to me, if his attitude's right, I would be very interested in him. Now the sixth uh, person on that list, sixth best remaining free agent, is also a cornerback, Brian Poole. Uh, what do you think of that one? If he's healthy, there was some some stuff that went on with some surgery there. They signed Troy Hill in the slot, but if they want another guy who's got proven slot coverage abilities, one of Pro Football Focus's higher graded slot players. So, like to me, if they want that type of player for cheap, they can still go get him and have like if they don't draft well, take this day for example, if they don't find a corner at the right value or they wanted two and they only come away with one. Troy Hill is was a predominantly an outside corner in his early career with the Rams, and just last year went inside when Nikel Roby Coleman went to Philadelphia, and he had a nice year inside. But obviously, he's got a, a ton of experience on the outside. So if they wanted to say, okay, we'll have Troy be a flexible outside guy, also have Brian here, that could make sense to me. But again, it's it's reactionary to what they are able to do or not do in the draft. Let me ask you this: as far as the draft goes. Who do you like at 26 that, that has a – I won't say that's a dead solid lock to be there, but somebody that's likely to be there who if the Browns took him, you'd be like, I really like that pick. 
Greg Newsom. I, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of scenarios where he is there. Um, you know, teams I said earlier, the Titans, Bears, Colts could all they could all take different players. They could all they could they could take linemen. Uh, the, the, the Titans lost Corey Davis. They could take a wide receiver like Rashad Bateman, like Elijah Moore, if they wanted to, to replace him. So if Greg Newsom's there in a lot of scenarios, he is there. I would I would think that to me would be uh, a really good indicator for a nice a nice start. So uh, there there's others, but that's the one I have landed on the most. I, I do all these mock draft simulators and they are a bit all over the board sometimes. And what's interesting when you do those mock draft simulators often you're all in a hypothetical sense, you're all using the same big board, right? Like you're all looking at the same players. So even as the computer's making picks, you can tell which the computer ranks them and you can kind of cheat the system and say, okay, I can get that guy later. Well, some other team might have him higher on their board and that's what makes the NFL draft so unique. I'm doing a 32 team user mock draft where a bunch of people from across Twitter who study different teams have done it. And, and, and um, Newsom was there at 26. And to me, that's a home run pick. And I think, uh, he makes a ton of sense with how the Browns like their corners to play. He's a mini Denzel Ward in terms of how he approaches the position, the hit fluidity, the the arrival at the ball uh, at, the, the, at the point of attack. He's able to go up and get the football, play it well, effectively. He's just got to he's just got to prove he can be on the field a long time. I mean, he's had some injury history, and, and I think he's only played 17 games over the last three years. Now, obviously, last year was a weird season and all of that, but uh, he's got to prove that. But he tested off the charts, and I think the film is really strong. And uh, he would fit. So I think that if they left the first round with Newsom, I would feel pretty good about that. Um, and then who, if somebody slides to like, I don't know, 17, 19, 20, Browns only have to give up a third round pick to move up and grab him. Who's somebody like that that would grab your attention that you think is possible? Well, I mean, the name that I've only really wanted to move up for is J.C. Horn. It was it was relatively possible earlier in this process. Then he tested off the charts at his pro day, and it's just been like people have figured out what are we doing? We're we're not ranking this guy as high as we should, and he's kind of disappeared. So is there like I don't know, Dave. I don't know. I don't I don't think there's a ton of guys that they would trade up for. I mean, I guess they could love a Wusu Koromoa and think like, okay, we only have to give up something to get him, but uh, then again, it's like even if he's a rover linebacker hybrid type, that's is that enough a uh, value there? Uh, the, the the better defensive end edge guys all have red flags in some capacity, whether it's uh, the ability to stay on the field, it's the it's getting enough snaps, uh, whether it's the market share, they didn't produce enough at the college level or they didn't test well enough. So it's like it's a weird spot. It really is unique. And like to the point that where it, if they moved up for somebody outside of Horn. I would just be surprised. I guess if 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 Jalen Waddle or Devontae Smith, the two wide receivers from Alabama, fall, they could be interested in those guys. Uh, but I, again, trading up for a wide receiver when you have what you have on the roster right now, and you're playing this long game approach, it just all signs to me point to we're either staying here if there's a guy we have one of the top seven grades on in our range, or we're just going to feel comfortable moving back and collecting picks in the second, third, and into next year. So. I wish I had a better answer there, but I, I just, it's such a weird year that I don't have a great feel for anybody that they would want to move up for. Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. On the other side of the break, we'll hear some guys that uh, Jake thinks could be risky picks. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Life is starting to get back on track, and you can too. If you or your family have experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, Tri-Seek can help with full tuition assistance. Safely get the in-demand degree or training you need with online and on-campus classes. Go to tric-edu to check out our programs and resources. So what are you waiting for? Register now for summer classes. Tri-C is where futures begin. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just a mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory.
Sports for CLE continues. I'm Dave Bacon. D and Jimmy Haslam, the owners of the Browns, met with the media, and uh, both of them very happy with the way the front office and the head coach have worked together to get this roster headed in the right direction. And Kevin had been with the Vikings, what, 12, 13 years, had never been a head coach anywhere, and yet if you came to practice that first day or heard his first talk to the team, you'd never think, well, I can tell this guy's new. I mean, they both – stepped right in, they're natural leaders, they're very calm, they're thoughtful, they plan and organize things well. And I, I don't want to say it was a surprise because we had our expectations, but they surpassed expectations in term, terms of becoming the top person in personnel and the head coach in the NFL. Yeah, great leaders. Let's welcome back in uh, Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. And Jake, um, the Haslam's got it right. We haven't heard a lot from them. Uh, I think they've been the owner, the, the type of owners you had hoped they would be um, after getting the GM and, and the co head coach handled. Yeah, listen, they're lucky that Kevin was available and willing to come back. I mean, like, I, I listen, it's easy for me to sit at a desk and say this, but like they missed the year before and they, they, they clearly trusted John Dorsey to make his call. And while that's okay because you don't want to work for micromanagers all the time, there's a scenario here, Dave, where it plays out and in the next year, Kevin gets hired by somebody else. And he's like, forget Cleveland. I don't even want to interview with those guys again because of what they did to me. They had me as a real front runner. They knew I deserved that job was the best player, you know, the best coach for that position. And they passed on me. There's people that are like that, wired that way. And that's totally fine. But he's seems like, you know, Kevin almost seems too good to be true in the fact that he doesn't hold grudges. He doesn't hold himself above anybody else. He doesn't think his opinion is above and beyond anyone else. And he's just seems so level headed and so unique in his perspective. It's it's very fresh in the way he's tied to Andrew Barry, who I think if you shook hands and hung out, say you're at a, at a casual get together, you wouldn't even know those guys were in these prominent positions because they don't they don't carry themselves that way. They they don't they don't want eyes on them all the time. They don't want to be told that they're more important than anybody else. They are process people. And, you know, for Kevin to to come back and, and re-interview this year and be so willing to take this position, I should say, before last year, uh, it speaks a lot to who he is as a football coach and as a person. And 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 listen, I'll give Dee and Jimmy credit for, for, for going back, circling the wagons. And I'm sure they sat in that room with him and said, hey, we made a big mistake and we should have hired you a year earlier. And they they probably amended it and, they, and kudos to them for finding their guy, you know, their guy and allowing to him to trust a young head coach and trust a young GM and Andrew Barry. That takes a leap of faith to trust young people like that and a GM of color, which I think is which is just awesome, like not enough black general managers in the in the industry when this is an industry that is predominantly black. Like I think they're on the forefront of hiring uh, in the right way, hiring people, not worrying about all the good old boy network. Uh, I think that they're at the forefront of hiring people, regardless of, of skin color or race or ethnicity. And that's awesome. So I give them kudos for that. So uh, it's a lot of thanks to Kevin Stefanski for being willing to come back and, and re-interview and not be too prideful in his approach. Uh, and, and, and kudos to uh, you know Jimmy and Dee for being willing to accept that mistake and make it right. And then go pair him with a young guy who uh, it takes a leap of faith, a guy that young, and, uh, and 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 I know he was with Cleveland before, and they knew him, and they knew about him, but still, entrusting your roster development and all of that to a person his age is is not easy, and I, I give him kudos for that. So they deserve the praise that they're receiving right now. Yeah, and, and you know what? He's uh, Andrew Barry's rewarded him handsomely. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Caleb Farley. Um, that's a guy that, by all accounts, huge talent, had the back surgery. Is he... Is he somebody that is worth the risk, do you think? I'll say this. Caleb Farley's tape is a top 12 pick player. If he falls to pick 26, what do you think the reason is he falls to pick 26? Like, it's probably because teams don't trust the medicals and they don't trust, trust people that have, you know, Dave, maybe you have back injuries, man. A lot, a lot of people have back injuries. I've had uncomfortable back injuries, and it, 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 it's so rare for backs to just get better. Like when your back starts going, typically that's the end of, of your process. And it's like for a guy that young to have that many back procedures now too in his early career, it's like, what's going on there? And is there something long-term that is going to be an issue for him? Now, I don't know how serious the operations were. I'm not privy to that. 
Uh, it seems like medicals have slowly been trickling in all the way up to this week, medical information trickling in. Like I heard yesterday about a knee issue for Aziz Ojolari, the edge defender from Georgia that I had never even heard before. So like I would imagine NFL teams are scrambling. That's a big reason why Indianapolis is so great for the combine is that you get full medical evals on all these guys at one time. There's no waiting for it. You get it right then and right there it's, as well as your testing data. You don't have to go to all of these pro days and set up all these different things to get it done. You get data in that big, you know, one fell swoop, which is so convenient. And I know Andrew Barry and his staff have talked about that on building the Browns. That has just been a tenuous thing. It's been a problem. So that is a big reason why going into Thursday, Friday, there's a lot of unexpected uh, information like Terrace Marshall has had some, the wide receiver from LSU has had some, some injury buzz and some people are taking him out of any first round conversation. So I just think this is going to be a crazy draft. And I think we could see things that are way off from the public's opinion heading into this thing. Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of coaches use these social media profiles and, and insiders to get out smoke screens for people uh, and information they want to be made public. And I think it just has a chance to be like a, Seven or eight times you're like, whoa, didn't expect that guy to go here or there or whatever. And uh, and Caleb Farley is going to be an interesting case. He says he's healthy. His agent says he's healthy. When he went to Indianapolis, they had a, they have had rounds of testing and, and, and where they've tried to get guys together. And they say he's healthy. But it, to, to me, I keep going back to the fact that this guy's too good. He's too young. If he's sitting there at 26, there's got to be a reason. And are the Browns comfortable being the team that takes a chance on that reason? So we'll see. Uh, last thing I'll ask you before I let you go, there's, there are some guys that are older, so the age guardrails that the Browns have put up. T take us through a couple of those the, that you think might be intriguing. Yeah, I mean, we just wrote on this at the OBR today. We've done draft study for so long now. We've done it for like five months. Stephen Thomas, who's our guy who does at Browns Daily Mock Draft on Twitter, or at, at Browns Daily Mock, He's phenomenal, and he covers it from so many different angles, and he's literally putting out a mock draft a day. If you're interested in that, he's putting out a detailed mock draft every day, and one of the, the things that we talked about all year is that they, dating back to Andrew Berry's time with Sashi Brown, uh, into his time in Philadelphia, and his first draft as a leading voice of picks, they have never really drafted anybody who has been 23 at the time of the draft. And the only one that we have seen 23 turned in their rookie season was Jordan Elliott last year, who turned 23 in November of his rookie season. So like anybody right now who's 23, we're kind of eliminating because we don't have any data that tells us they want that age of player. You know, you draft a guy 23, 24, by the time his second contract's here, you're looking at a guy 27, 28 years old. That's not great. You want the guys 20, 21, 22, so that they're 24, 25, 26 when they're getting a second deal. And you can get, you know, the healthiest athleticism days of athletes are 20 to 29. Uh, you get those years and, and you spend wise money on those people. So we have we have analyzed it all year from eliminating those guys. I thought it would be fun that if we looked at players that the Browns maybe would bend those age guardrails on would be fun. A couple guys that we talked about, Carlos Basham, who's a defensive end from Wake Forest, a lot of fun. Um, he's 23 right now, could be a good player. Uh, I think he's good. He's a top 50 talent, uh, but, but I think he's just a little older. So will they take him? I don't know. Richie Grant is a top rated safety on Dane Brugler's board. Uh, but he's a guy who's 24 years old currently. So like maybe that guy's the most talented, but you got to think Dave, they're playing college football at 23, 24 years old against 20, 21, 22 year olds. So they should be dominating that age, right? So that's kind of like the balance is an evaluator you're trying to figure out is, is this 24 year old gonna impact right away? Like right this second. So Jabril Cox, the LSU kid I mentioned earlier is already 23. He started out at North Dakota State, redshirted a year because he injured his knee going into his senior year of high school football. So he's a little older because then he transferred over to LSU and played out his senior year there. Um, that's a guy we've talked about a guy late, a couple guys late Zeke, or it could be pronounced Zeke, Z-E-C-H McPherson from Texas tech is a fun corner that people haven't talked about a ton, but could be a mid round target already 23 and some change started out at Penn state for a couple years before getting to Texas tech. So the thing that's fun is that like another guy named Jacob Harris, who's a six, five tight end, 220 pounds, a little light, but he's a four, four 40 guy at eight touchdown catches on 30 targets over 600 yards last year a freak, but like 
His story's crazy. He went and originally went to like Florida International to play soccer, wanted to then play football. So he went to Western Kentucky, dropped out of Western Kentucky, took a year off, coached JV football, walked back on at UFC the following year, UCF, sorry, not the fight club, but UCF Central Florida the following year. Uh, got a scholarship after that first year. And he's like 24, almost 25, but he's a freak athlete. So there's just interesting stories. If you're interested in reading on some of these guys, which usually there's a reason why they're older, they didn't have a, a clean path where they played 18, they played at 19, 20, 21, and now they're ready to be drafted at 2021. Uh, there's just some fun stories. So there's a, it's an interesting piece. And if the Browns do bend the guardrails, there's some fun players in there that could really help them. Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. Great stuff. Appreciate it. Remember, uh, draft night, 730, both Thursday and Friday. The OBR YouTube channel, Jake, and the whole Orange and Brown Report crew will be breaking it down with the Cleveland Slant. Jake, great stuff. Appreciate the time. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Always my pleasure. All right, Jake Burns from the Orange and Brown Report. We're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk baseball. Lake County captains getting ready for the minor league season. We will hear from the general manager and the chairman, Peter Carfagna, Jen Yorko, straight ahead on Sports for CLE. Presque Isle Downs and Casino has sports betting. Use one of our 50 state-of-the-art Bet America kiosks to place your bet and watch your favorite games on one of our many HD televisions or visit our sportsbook area only at Presque Isle Downs and Casino. Better days are ahead. Be ready with the training you'll need to get a great job. If you or your family has experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, try seeking help with full tuition assistance. Whether you want to improve your skills, get certified, or train for a new career, Go to try-c.edu to check out our programs and resources. So what are you waiting for? Register now for online and on-campus summer classes. Try-C is where futures begin. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just the mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. Sports for CLE continues. We're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about baseball. Indian season underway. Minor leagues getting ready to go as well. Uh, that means places like Lake County, the high A affiliate of the Indians now. Uh, let's welcome in Peter Carfania, chairman of Lake County Captains, along with Jen Yorko, general manager of the Lake County Captains. Jen, Peter, appreciate the time. How excited are you guys to get minor league baseball back and rolling here uh, in the Cleveland area? Can't wait, David. Thanks so much for having us on. We're here at Classic Park. The fields never look better. Uh, May 11th, we'll be welcoming all our fans back. And, and it's been too long. We, we miss this is an extension of our family out here. We welcome all of our friends and families back to uh, what we call our summer home here at Classic Park. So uh, thanks for having us. All right. So, Jen, um, what are some of the things that are going on? And, and um, how many fans can you have? What, uh, what are the parameters that, uh, that are in place? Uh, as again, you get ready May 11th to get baseball underway at uh, Lake County. Yeah, May 11th, we're so excited. It was a long off season for us, if you will. Um, so we're excited to welcome our fans back to Classic Park. And here you can expect to see about 3,000 fans each game until some of the health and safety protocols loosen in the state. Um, we're, we're really excited, making sure that uh, fans feel safe when they come. 
fans will have to wear masks in the ballpark unless they're actively eating and drinking. Um, but you can find a lot of fun promotions here, starting off with uh, Tuesday Buck Night and, uh, you know, capping the season off with or the home stand off with um, Kids Run the Bases on Family Fun Day. Um, guys, what's been the biggest challenge? Uh, you know, there was no minor league baseball at all um, a, a year ago. What's been the biggest challenge for, for each of you um, with the captains? Pete, let's, Peter, let's start with you. What biggest challenge from, from your perspective? Yeah, expanding and contracting to fill the, to fill the available space, David. You know, like, like really, uh, when we were told there would be no games at all last year, we had to be very, very careful about the elasticity of our staff. Jen and, and our other staff members have just done an amazing job of keeping the core group together so that we can launch into a full 60 game homestand. You know, uh, we'll play 120 games. We're starting May 4th on the road. Uh, the, the hardest part was, was recognizing our organization, which again, Jen has done an amazing job of keeping our core intact so that we can launch into a 60 game home season here, 120 games. Uh, and, and accommodate up to 3,000 people on day one. Uh, so that, that's been the biggest challenge, I would say, is, is right-sizing, and I give Jen and our staff great credit for hanging in there. Uh, also, we were the practice facility, as you know, the taxi squad, so to speak, for the Indians, and that gave us 90 days to figure out how to run, you know, a COVID-compliant uh, facility with our parent club, the Indians. So we're, we're way down the road in terms of complying with the major league protocols and minor league protocols and making the place safe for our for, our, for the certainly for the play and for our, our friends and family that are going to come out as fans uh, starting May 11th. Jen, how excited are you that you're going to get to have some of those uh, promotions um, at the ballpark that that minor league fans have been so excited uh, to to be a part of? Um, and I know those are relatively new, and, and you're probably hoping to expand them as um, things around the state loosen up. Uh, hopefully, later in the summer as well. Yeah, here at the ballpark, you'll find a lot of the protocols that we've been working hard in the off season on to make sure seats are compliant and distanced while still giving the season ticket holders and our fans the view of the ballpark that they want and including them in all of the promotions that we can. So for us, you know, we just continue to work with the local health department and the state to make sure that we're making sure that everyone is safe in our facility, fans, players, staff. Um, and then we'll continue to pivot on those guidelines as we've done through the entire offseason to make the place um, as loud and fun as we can, but also make sure that everyone's safe while coming to Classic Park. Peter, um, uh, high A as opposed to, um, you, you know, the, the lower A level. Um, tell me how excited you are about the brand of baseball that's going to be there um, this year. And there have been quite a few uh, guys that are pitching in Cleveland that have come through Lake County along the way. And I know uh, that's close to your heart there. Oh, you know, we're lifelong Indians fans, and Carter Hawkins and everybody else uh, uh, up and down the line have been great partners in, in this enterprise since 2003. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, almost every starter, uh, the current staff, uh, pitched here at the county, starting with Bieber and Savale, and, you know, it's a plea sack, and on and on it goes, and Tristan McKenzie. And you're going to see much more of that, David, uh, this year. You're going to see much more because high A, we're, we're like two steps away. From, from playing down for the big club. And and really then it's Akron and, and a lot of times you can skip AAA. So you're gonna see people who are just two steps away uh, from playing the big club. And we're, we couldn't be more excited. Uh, Jen, what are some of the challenges that you're looking at um, as far as getting people in the seats and getting the word out that, hey, tickets are on sale now. I mean, your tickets for the opener May 11th are on sale. So take us through some of the things that, uh, that you're trying to do and get getting the word out. Yeah, they just went on sale on Monday. So up until then, we were working with season ticket holders on relocating their seats and finding the best possible place for them in the facility so they can still enjoy the game as much as they did before all of the protocols were in place. And so tickets are on sale now. We're shouting it out from the rooftops, you know, sending out newsletters, putting ads in papers, on radios, just letting everybody know that Captain's Baseball is back at Classic Park for 2021. Jen Yorko, Peter Carfagna, as always, appreciate the time and uh, letting us know what's going on um, down at uh, Classic Park for the Lake County Captains. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. On the other side of the break, we're going to hear from the manager of this year's Lake County Captains, Greg Desenzo, straight ahead to talk a little bit about who's going to be on the field at Lake County. 
Sports for CLE will be right back. Stay with us. Life is starting to get back on track, and you can too. If you or your family have experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, Tri-C can help with full tuition assistance. Safely get the in-demand degree or training you need with online and on-campus classes. Go to trice-edu to check out our programs and resources. So what are you waiting for? Register now for summer classes. Tri-C is where futures begin. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just a mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. Welcome back to Sports for CLE. I'm Dave Bacon. We continue talking Lake County Captains baseball as they're getting ready for high A baseball at Classic Park. Let's welcome in the new manager of the Lake County Captains this year, Greg Desenzo. Greg, uh, appreciate the time. Tell us some of the guys you are excited to have uh, on the field this year down at high A. I mean, I'm not quite sure if the, the roster has been solidified uh, completely just yet. As you know, we... Uh, we often hold those those names pretty close to the chest up until the 11th hour. But suffice to say, we're going to see some of the top players in our entire organization uh, coming to Lake County this summer. I think it'll be a really exciting brand of baseball, as um, you guys had mentioned in the previous segment. I think it's uh, got some of our, our, again, some of our top players in the organization that, uh, that will be making their home at uh, Classic Park this summer. So I'm, I'm fired up to have a chance to see them compete with a scoreboard on. Uh, finally, and have a chance to coach these guys up a little bit. In college, you coached um, in the Cape Cod League. How excited are you to get your first uh, taste of minor league managing here? I couldn't be more excited. I mean, last year uh, was my first year, as you stated. I was a college coach for 20 plus, 20 plus years and, uh, you know, made that change and, and that challenge as a family uh, and a decision that we made that, that was a really hard one. But if I was going to leave uh, to go to an organization, uh, it would have to be an organization that I felt was one of the best in professional sports, let alone baseball itself. So uh, wearing this uniform, uh, super proud to wear it, uh, humbled to put this on every day and even more excited to put a captain's one on. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been 13, 14 months here since I got hired. Uh, so I'm excited to get out, uh, get out on the field with the boys. How, how different, how exciting is it that you know that the major league club is uh, basically in the big city where uh, you're 30 minutes away, if that. So uh, there's got to be that and, and all the development people that, uh, that are available to help you as well. There certainly will be uh, plenty of resources for me to, to, you know, to aid and assist our entire staff through this, you know, through this first year, or th at least through my first year as, as manager um, with the captain. So um, that's, that's a relief, to be quite honest with you, to, to know that there's plenty of folks that I can lean on. But at the end of the day, you know, once that first pitch is thrown or once the puck's dropped, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's baseball. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that I've got a pretty good feel working with the guys and haven't had a chance to work on the spring training last year, coupled with this past fall, I was out here in Arizona for, for five weeks working with the guys. So uh, continuing to build those relationships. And now, like I said, getting a chance to do so with, uh, with the scoreboard on and the lights on uh, pretty excited about that. Well, Greg, we will uh, let's get back with you when uh, when you have your 
your guys and have played some games and you can tell us about some of the guys we should start listening out for uh, in the years to come. Appreciate the time. Um, mm -hmm. Let's make sure we get back with you um, when we can talk about some of those players and some of the good things that are going on on the field. So, Greg Desenzo, appreciate the time. Thanks very much. Sounds great. Look forward to seeing you again. Appreciate it. All right, Greg Desenzo, manager of the Lake County Captains. That'll do it for us uh, on this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you again tomorrow. Scheduled guest, Jeff Risden. We will also talk to Marty Gibbons, head coach of the Lake Catholic Cougars football team. He gets to announce one of the picks in the upcoming NFL draft. That's all ahead tomorrow. Sports for CLE, 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.